Welcome back, guys. So, in part two of the series, uh, you know, we ended by talking briefly about Theodoric's time as a hostage in Constantinople, and we mentioned that, you know, at some point he leaves around the time he's 18 years of age, and then he comes back a couple of years later to the gates of Constantinople with an army. In order to get to the bottom of why he does that and what that has to do with him uh, eventually going into Italy at the behest of the Roman Emperor Zeno to go conquer Italy in the name of the Roman Empire, it probably would be a good idea to try and trace what exactly is happening after he leaves Constantinople the first time and why he left in the first place. So, in the modern day US, people reach the majority at age 18. So when you reach that age, you can vote, you can join the military, you can't drink for some reason, uh, but you are an adult in most aspects of US law. In the Roman period, Theodoric is released at age 18, but he's not an adult. Rome had a different legal situation. So in Roman law, you hit your majority at age 25 or thereabouts. So, when he's released at age 18, he's still what the Romans uh, would consider to be a minor. So then we have this problem. Well, he's not released at the age of majority. He's released when, to the Romans, he's still a kid. So, why is this? There are two prevailing ideas for why he was released this early. The first is that Theodoric originally went to Constantinople as a hostage at age 8 as a show of good faith, as a sign of, you know, goodwill that his father Theodomer was going to uh, you know, stick to the terms of the treaty, whereby he becomes a Roman ally and he gets what we would understand to be like foreign aid in the form of uh, money from the Roman state. It is entirely possible that, in, in this, by the way, we don't know for certain, but it, it is entirely possible that the terms of the original treaty stated that maybe he's released at age 18. Maybe that's the age of majority under Gothic law. We don't really know. The other interpretation and this, to my mind, is the one that makes a little more sense considering what happens as soon as he is released, is that there was some kind of uh, emergency. So that begs the question then, well, if there was an emergency that required this kid to be released, well then, what is the situation? What's the emergency? So Theodoric's father, Theodomer, had two brothers, one of whom, for this particular story, isn't really uh, important. The other guy, though, Valimer, Theodoric's uncle is important. There are maybe some indications, depending on how you read the, you know, admittedly patchy sources, there were some indications that maybe Valimer was trying to weasel his way into rulership of Theodoric's group of Goths. Around 470, we think. It might have been around 460, we don't really know. Um, somewhere in that 10, 20 year period, Valimer appears to have died. So what that then means is that Theodoric's father, Theodomer, at least in theory, uh, becomes ruler, maybe not the uncontested ruler, but the ruler of this group of Goths, the Pannonian Goths. And then, in theory, it follows that Theodoric uh, becomes the heir of Theodomer. So, that emergency might have had to do with the Gothic political situation. Maybe all of a sudden, uh, the tables turn, and now the opportunity has arisen for Theodoric to secure his place as an heir for his people, to be the ruler once his father, you know, bites the dust. That might have happened. But like I said, maybe Valimer didn't die around 470. We have some other scrappy sources which suggest maybe it was 460, 10 years before he's released. So if that's the case, well then maybe there's something else going on. We don't really know. We just don't have the evidence. That happens a lot with stuff in, you know, antiquity. But if that is the case then, if Valimer died around 460, then that means Theodoric would have left 10 years too late. Okay, so maybe it's not necessarily a crisis of legitimacy. Or maybe it is, we don't know. But if Valimer did die 10 years earlier, then there might have been another reason. So what is that? The answer um, is... Roman, or in this period, was slowly getting into the Byzantine phase of Roman history, so we might say Byzantine politics. Now, what did those look like? Well, this is basically what's going on, and we'll get to these two coins 
Marcin and Leo in a minute. Between about 350-ish and 450, 460, definitely with the rise of uh, Ricimer into the 470s. The Roman emperors in both the Western Empire and the Eastern Empire are strongly dominated and influenced by uh, generals. It's probably not incorrect, and there are books and articles with, you know, similar titles to refer to this approximately 100-year period as the Era of Generals, the Age of Warlords. Um, you know, there's a famous book, it's called Late Roman Warlords. I forget who wrote it off the top of my head. But, back to my point... Roman emperors in this period are dominated by military men, people who we've mentioned in other videos. You know, Stilicho, Arbogast, uh, Ricimer, who's probably the most infamous. He's known as the uh, puppet master for good reason. The list goes on here. There's a lot of these guys. Well, in the late 400s, in Constantinople, the guy in charge is technically Martian. And then after Marcion, you know, technically Leo, they're both emperors. And you can see their coins in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen here. Uh, but really, they're dominated by this guy, Aspar. Aspar was half of Alonic by birth. So to the Romans, he's in part a filthy barbarian. He's somebody that, you know, is probably going to have a reputation for brutishness and nastiness and not necessarily somebody that people are going to look up to. Somebody that, if they were to bite the dust in less than honest circumstances, probably the Romans wouldn't, you know, bat an eye. But he's the guy in charge. He's the power behind both of these emperors' thrones. And he also appears to have been aware, because, you know, he's not stupid, despite what Roman propaganda would have you believe. He knows that because of his birth, because he's an Alon, he can't become emperor. So the next best option is to be the guy behind the emperors pulling the strings. He's the puppet master in the east. Well, at some point, Leo decides he's had enough of this. So, what does he do? Well, he tries to get rid of Aspar, because if he gets rid of Aspar, if he gets rid of this general, the power behind the throne, then at least in theory, Leo can rule the empire in his own right. And the problem is that Aspar is the general. He has men, he has troops. So what do you do? You have to fight fire with fire. So Leo needs his own troops. Where does he go to get these people? And the answer is he goes to this little red circle on the map um, of Anatolia. So this is a region known in antiquity as Isauria. So the Isaurians had a fierce reputation among the Romans. They were bandits, they were thieves, uh, they were good warriors, they were excellent fighters, in part because the environment where they live is very mountainous, very uh, arid. It's a not a nasty place, it's just a difficult place to live. So, these are tough people. During the 400s, 410, 420, 430, 440, definitely since at least the 430s, maybe a little bit earlier, many of these guys were uh, recruited into the Roman army to fight Attila and his Huns. And by the 450s, by the 460s, after the fall of the Hunnic Empire, of the Asaurians are becoming more and more important politically and militarily. And among the Asaurians, the most important guy is this dude named Zeno, who we will talk about more in a minute because he becomes a uh, Roman emperor. I've already mentioned him. So Zeno and his group of Asaurians, they become the Emperor Leo's champions. They become the guys who go into Constantinople and oust Aspar. They kill him. So... That's one kingmaker, that's one general out of the way. The problem is that Leo doesn't really appear to have fully thought through what he was doing, or maybe he did, we don't really know. But he gets rid of one kingmaker, and then Zeno just becomes the new power behind the throne, and he ties himself more closely to Leo because he marries um, Ariadne, Leo's daughter. So now he's a puppet master, again. So Leo's stuck with the same situation, and now this guy is married into the royal family. So this is the immediate context in which Theodoric up and leaves Constantinople. This is what's going on. Alright, so there were multiple groups of Goths running around in this period. There were a couple that were um, under Hunnic domination. There was a group of the Visigoths settled in what is today like southwestern France. There's a couple groups up around the Black Sea. Uh, but for our story here, the two most important are these red and blue dots. The red dot on the map here, these are the Thracian Goths. 
the blue dot are the Pannonian Goths. The Pannonian Goths are uh, Theodoric Amal's people. Confusingly, the red dot, the Thracian Goths, are also led by Theodoric. This is uh, Theodoric Strabo, it means like the squinter. So, when Theodoric Amal leaves, he goes back to the Pannonian Goths. But he's got an issue here. And the issue has to do with the Thracian Goths, and that's directly going to play into what's happening in Constantinople. So the Thracian Goths, they were officially allies of Rome. Um, and Theodoric Strabo was also the nephew of Aspar's wife. So when Zeno kills Aspar, it pisses off Theodoric, and it pisses off the Thracian Goths. So what do you do? Well, the Thracian Goths revolted. So what happens then is as this is going on, the Pannonian Goths uh, see some kind of an opportunity to maybe insert themselves into East Roman politics. So, they pull up stakes, and this is probably to boost Theodoric's standing, and we'll get more into this in a minute. Um, and they attack the Roman city of Sigidunum. And once they take it over, they refuse to hand it back to the Romans, they're basically holding it ransom. Instead, they try to work out a treaty. They say, look, the Thracian Goths are revolting against you. You're fighting them. Replace them with us. And we'll fight them for you. So, why is this going on? Why all of a sudden? So these people picked up stakes and they attack a Roman city. Uh, but before we talk about the role in politics a little more, we have to talk a little bit about what this group actually looked like. Because the professionals, the scholars, aren't really certain. So, the old 19th century view when history starts becoming like an academic discipline in the sense that, you know, this is something you can go to a university for, you can take courses, you can get a degree, um, it develops methodology, stuff like that. It's not just like rich people with an interest in the past. There's actual uh, academics involved. The way this stuff was viewed was through the lens of German nationalism. Well, these are people who are you know, complete peoples. They have their own uh, distinct cultures, where the warriors go, so too to their families, etc. So this is like, you know, nations on the move. So the old way of viewing this was it was an entire nation picking up stakes and moving. Modern scholarly advances, uh, they've complicated this picture and they've rejected chunks of it. So we know from the sources that Theodoric Amal probably has 9, 10, 11, maybe 12, maybe 13,000 warriors. Somewhere in that range, give or take one or two thousand. So, to be a warrior, well, what do you need? You need weapons, yeah, but you also need food. You need other resources. You need clothing. If something breaks, you have to mend it. Where do these people get it? Well, the old answer, and to a degree some scholars still look at it like this, you can get it through plundering, through raiding. And you can. Armies do this all the time. But for the length of time that this group is around, it doesn't make sense for them to constantly plunder. What that means is that there probably was um, some kind of other population element. There very probably were wives, there very probably were children, and this makes sense in the context of, you know, Theodoric and other barbarians besides this group of Goths trying to get, like, farmland places to settle. You don't need that if you just have an army. If you have a family, you definitely have to. Um, so, who else do they have with them? Again, probably children, probably wives... You know, they have a baggage train, but what exactly is in that train? What does it look like? The sources inform us that uh, among the warriors, there's something of a divide here. There's an upper group, maybe not like a caste in the, you know, proper sense of the term, but definitely an upper echelon of the warriors. And then below them, there's a, a lower kind of second tier group. We also know that, and it depends how much you really want to accept this interpretation, because the sources are kind of sketchy, uh, but there appears to be, among Germanic society, broadly speaking in this period, at least three divisions. Again, if this interpretation is actually correct. The freemen, the freedmen who were slaves or otherwise who were freed, um, given manumission, and then they carry that mark with them. And then there are slaves. The sources also tell us, you know, again, that the Goths wanted farmland via Roman treaty. So all of that taken in aggregate tells us the following. The upper group of warriors at Upper Crust, they probably were professionals. This is probably Theodoric and Theodomir and maybe a couple hundred uh, or maybe a thousand, depending on how many resources they have, of like a professional uh, war band. 
what you sometimes see in Latin sources as the comitatus. The lower levels, they're probably a combination of people that were farmers who also happened to be warriors when the, you know, need arose, when circumstances dictated. Those people probably had in their baggage train, because, again, the sources tell us the Goths wanted farmland and other things of that nature, they probably had women, they probably had families, they probably had children, they probably had slaves. Now, how big those things were, we don't really know. Based on a lot of anthropological studies and studies of migration and population movements, um, we can maybe estimate for every warrior there were maybe between three and five people in total in terms of a family unit. So maybe at max there was like 50, 60,000 people. That's not too large of a number to be dismissed. It's kind of like that happy middle ground in uh, interpretations. Not too small, but not too big. So this is probably what this group looks like as they're moving. We also know that in this period, groups constantly gained and lost people. Slaves, they absorbed other groups of conquered peoples. Sometimes they had refugees, etc. What this then means, okay, is that the Pannonian Goths on the move and other groups of people on the move weren't, you know, peoples in the sense of, like, uh, distinct nations or tribes. These things were political units, yes. Maybe there was some um, cultural homogeneity. We don't really know. There might have been kernels of common traditions, but it's also likely that individual chunks had their own ideas, their own traditions. So this thing is as much a tribe, if we want to call it that, as it is uh, a mobile field army. And other groups like the Franks function in similar ways. So what that means is that what there is among these people is a broad political identity. Again, probably with different folk customs and cultures the farther down the chain you go. But it's in everyone's interest here to cooperate and work together. Because if one of us is screwed, well then potentially we're all screwed. So then we have to understand that this is the type of unit that's moving and the type of unit that's going to be negotiating with the East Roman government. But, you know, on the flip side, no matter what your interpretation of that evidence is, I mean, to a degree, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that, ultimately, no matter what, doing this, picking up stakes and going to attack uh, Sigadunum, and trying to hold the city ransom was a huge risk. These people could have just been annihilated. The East Roman Empire at this point in time was remarkably powerful. Not as powerful as it would be later, um, but at this period, you know, at least in comparison with the West, they have high tax revenues, they have a very strong military at this point in time. Attila was vanquished, so he's gone, um, and peace was struck with Persia. So if something happened, if the Romans wanted to, they could, at least in theory, concentrate all their forces against this one chunk of people and they could be annihilated. But it's a risk that also might pay off. The Goths might increase their uh, material prosperity. It's also a political gamble that for Theodoric and Theodomer might pay off, because once Valimer's out of the way, and Theodomer becomes a uh, ruler, at least in theory of all the Goths, and Theodoric in theory becomes his heir, well, you have to make that undisputed. To do that, you have to show the Goths, or this group of Goths anyway, that you are worth following. This is how they're trying to do that. So this is the context in which these people ultimately arrive at Constantinople. So with that in mind then, we're going to leave now with the Goths still at this captured city, still trying to work their way into East Roman politics, and in the next video, fully pick up with that. So I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Take care, and I will see you all next time.